we need to define what capitalism is. So, right. TK, I want to talk to you about the problems or specifically the problem with capitalism. But before we do that, I want to talk to you about this Instagram account that I follow. It's called Humans of Capitalism. Mm. And there is this image. Jordan, I'm going to have you find it and put it on the screen in, in post-production here. There is this picture, which I'll describe if you're just listening to the audio version of the podcast. It's a picture of desk chairs, but they are shaped like coffins. So it's coffin-shaped desk chairs. And Wow. I saw this. <laughs> and what I think about when I see that image is, yeah, many of us are doing something where we're not really living. And if you're not really living, then one might say you're dying. So you're not literally dead there at the desk chair. But then I see the other side of it. As a writer, I sit down every day and, and many of the times I feel most alive is at a desk chair. So it's not binary. It's not that if you sit in a desk chair, therefore you are not living life. But it is that, oh, it's calling out the one of one of the problems with capitalism is if I put money first, mm. if I'm interested in value extraction more than I am with value creation, mm -hmm. those are two different types of capitalism. So let me hand it to you, TK, by saying this. I think we need to talk about what is capitalism because mm. we can use capitalism as a pejorative. And when someone uses it pejoratively, what they're really talking about, I think, is crony capitalism mm. or the use of people in order to make money. We've turned profit into our God, value extraction into our God. The other side of capitalism is this, value creation, or what Ryan and you and I call adding value to our audience. Or if you are a big business, you can still add value to customers. And we appreciate that when people add value to our lives. When I can buy a product or service in a way that is not coercive or manipulative, right. mm -hmm. and you're providing that service for me, well, that's the type of capitalism that works. But there's this other side, and it's an ugly side. That yeah. really doesn't work. And I have a big problem with that. And I was hoping you could help me flesh this out. Yeah, you should have a big problem with that. So I prefer the term voluntarism over capitalism, because even though there is a way to define capitalism that is perfectly consistent with my economic philosophy, the root of the word capitalism is capital. And so when people think of capitalism, it has this negative connotation of meaning the exaltation of profits over people, pursuing capital at the expense of compassion, creativity, and goodwill towards other human beings. Mm. And that is a philosophy I disavow. I do not support any economic philosophy that says it's all about the money. And if you got the chance to screw people over and do unethical things in order to get a little bit richer, I want you to be able to do those things. Absolutely not. And in some debates and discussions on capitalism, that word strikes me as being hopelessly lost to that understanding. And so Sometimes it can be best to just adopt the new vocabulary because when people don't think they already know what you're going to say, there's a higher probability that they'll actually listen and they'll judge you on your actual words rather than associations of your words with someone that they know they disagree with. Mm -hmm. For me, voluntarism or rather positive capitalism, which is different from corporatism or crony capitalism, mm -hmm. is any economic condition that has three, three elements. Number one, Customer accountability, that businesses don't just get to profit independently of their ability to satisfy customers, create value for them and solve problems for them. They can't hide behind regulations and laws that allow them to be profitable in spite of the fact that their customers aren't happy with their service. To quote Milton Friedman, he says, in a true free market, you're not only free to succeed, but you're also free to fail. So if a business is not free to fail, because they're being artificially insulated from customer accountability by regulations, then that's not truly voluntarious. Freedom of competition. Can someone else, even the little guy, enter the market and at least try to compete with you at providing the service that you provide. There are many larger corporations that actually love regulations because they can afford the regulations. They can set aside millions of dollars in their budget every year mm -hmm. to hire lobbyists 
who do nothing more than try to advocate for regulations that sound good rhetorically, but that actually make it artificially difficult for the little guy, the small player to yeah. come in and compete with them. So although the rhetoric of most regulations, it's almost always to protect the little guy because you just can't sell anything without that rhetoric. Many of the biggest supporters of those of that kind of rhetoric are the big players that can afford all of the legal fees and so on to make it hard for people to compete with them. The third element is freedom of consumer choice. As a customer, do I have to buy your product no matter how much you dissatisfy me? Or am I free to express my dissatisfaction by saying, you know what, I'm going to take my money elsewhere and I'm going to pay this person who actually treats me with respect or who makes me feel valued. If you can use the power of law, big guy, big corporation to take those options away from me so that no matter how angry I am, well, you're the only provider in my geographical location and I got to pay you. And, and, and you can hide behind the law, well, then that's really not free, right? And mm -hmm. many people will say, well, that's capitalism. And I get what they mean, which is why I use the word voluntarism. I think more economic flourishing, more economic possibility, and more satisfaction is created when customers have the ability to hold businesses accountable, to opt out and put their money elsewhere. And when the average player has the ability to at least try to compete, no system is capable of producing human perfection, but that is the system that I believe that optimizes for human flourishing. Mm. Let me ask you something, because uh, yeah. this makes me- No, no, let me ask you something, brother. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Leave the jokes to me, TK. No, so um, when it, what, what it has me thinking of is, is uh, monopolies. So mm -hmm. in an unchecked capitalistic market, does that naturally lead to monopolies? So the fear of monopoly is one of the most effective persuasive tools against any kind of voluntary system. And it's a complicated argument. What I want to say here is that while monopolies are possible, we shouldn't fool ourselves into thinking that there is an economic system that makes monopolies impossible or even improbable. What I mean by that is there are real monopolies that exist for no other reason than that big, powerful corporations are able to establish regulatory hurdles that make it incredibly difficult for anyone else to enter the market and grow large enough to be able to compete with them. One of the things that we see that's so tragic is, you know, there used to be a time where pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps entrepreneurially were, was more possible than it is today. And one of the reasons why it's become increasingly difficult is because there are a number, a number of regulations that say, hey, in order to go into this kind of business, you got to have this kind of training. You got to have this, these conditions met. You got to have this kind of facility. And it sounds good on the surface, right? Because if I'm selling the business, I say, hey, look, man, don't you think that anybody who uh, braids hair or cuts hair should have a barber shop where you can go to? Yeah, that sounds mm -hmm. nice. Don't you think anybody who is in the business of braiding hair or cutting hair, that they ought to meet certain regulations, like have at least three chairs and, and look and sound this way? Yeah. Like, yeah, that sounds really good. That's great. But now what happens to that person who has about 20 customers, they're not very rich, they have that person come over to the apartment to get their hair braided and they say, hey, I'm going to have kids running around, the TV's going to be loud. And they're like, no, it's all good. Mm -hmm. I don't mind, right? They come over. You're putting that person in a position where what they do is illegal. And if they ever want to get to a place where they actually can do their business in a more professional way, they got to have a lot more capital to be able to get off the ground. You know, and so none of these things are perfect, but I think the notion of monopoly often gets laid at the feet of a system that lacks all of the regulatory hurdles, but sometimes monopolies are supported by regulations that are lobbied for by people who are really powerful and are threatened by creative people that have less power than them. Yeah. Did you enjoy this standalone Patreon highlight? If so, you can listen to full episodes of The Minimalist's private podcast available exclusively on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash the minimalists or click the link in the description. Your support keeps our podcast and YouTube channel 100% advertisement free.